I encourage people when they're creating products or marketing, always think about how the person receiving this feels that you can address it and, and be positive about it. So it's not about what somebody wants, it's actually about what they need. And for me, I'm most interested in what they emotionally need. So that, that's just that's how I design my events. Think about the email funny, right? Is this going to be really formal? So to making sure the tone is, is relaxing, especially when our topics are so intense with the ones yeah. that we do. Um, when you walk in the door, maybe you don't know somebody. So where do you go? Well, if we bottleneck the line for wine, it's less time for you to be able to feel comfortable because you're not drinking. <laughs> so I make sure, you know, that there is accessibility to getting your drink. Welcome to the Conversation Factory. I'm your host, Daniel Stillman. Each episode, I'll talk to an amazing conversation designer to try and distill insights we can all bring into our work and lives. Human conversation is a material that can be shaped by design, and shifting conversations in everyday meetings, in organizations, and yourself can create real change. And I hope to help you do it better and more authentically. I'd love to have you stay part of the conversation. Head over to theconversationfactory.com to sign up for my newsletter and never miss an episode. That's theconversationfactory.com. I'd also love for you to be part of the show. If there's a challenging transformation you're working through, head over to theconversationfactory.com, click coaching, and sign up for 30 minutes of free coaching that we might use on the show. Head over to theconversationfactory.com, hit coaching, and let me know what conversations you need help redesigning. Enjoy the episode. Women make 79 cents on the dollar compared to men. And that's wrong. Depending on how you cut the data, it's either slightly worse or slightly better, but it's still bad. It's a systemic problem, and most of us would throw up our hands and say, there's nothing I can do about it. Instead of doing nothing, Claire Wasserman has built a powerful community called Ladies Get Paid around a powerful and critical idea, fixing that wage gap. And while she says that, quote, this conversation needs an overhaul, it's not just talk. Claire's organization brings women together in town halls all over the country, where they focus on what women can do with their own hands, like learn better negotiation skills, and apply for jobs they might not feel ready for, but probably are. See, because men have been trained somehow to be more slash overconfident and apply for any jobs that they think they deserve, while the imposter syndrome seems to affect women more strongly. Claire is an experienced designer, designing in-person, transformational events in the same way that a UX designer crafts an app or an HR manager crafts a personnel policy. Thinking about the goal, the intended effect it will have on a person, and working backwards. It is, in the end, human-centered design. The materials change, but the goal is the same. That, after all, is the nature of and best definition for design. Making something to shift the way things are to the way you want them to be. Ladies Get Paid is designed by Claire to make the change she wants to see in the world, to change the conversation about gender and money. Beyond her amazing story and her journey to creating this company, I dove into how Claire architects her business, her events, and her community. One issue that Claire and I get into is how to include men in the conversation. What are the levers available to us to design an intimate, safe, and productive conversation for women, her primary audience, while allowing men to participate, to help, to learn? How do you design a conversation about gender issues without letting gender become an issue? Claire has been tinkering with a design that allows men to only ask questions. This format would draw a hard line on mansplaining, like jeopardy for conversations. It's a rigid restriction, but would keep men honest. Am I talking to be heard or to be curious and to learn? It's giving men who want to come to the town halls a hard line. Ask or be silent. Don't declare or explain. When I heard that idea, I offered another option. The fishbowl, a classic where men can only listen from the outside. It's a harder line, but easier to follow for the men, and there's a lot of intimacy created for the inner circle of the fishbowl, with no crosstalk possible, which is better. No men, men listening in with no input, or men inside the circle but only asking. 
Each conversation design has implications, repercussions, challenges. There's no best. Claire, like any great designer, will tinker, test, and try and see which feels right for her and her community. Two conversations we didn't talk about enough. How Claire manages her own internal conversation. Claire is bootstrapping ladies get paid financially and emotionally. Right now, she doesn't have the mentorship and support she is offering so energetically to others. Taking a step back and getting your core needs cared for is 100% essential for founders. The other conversation we didn't dig into is negotiation tips and perspectives. For that, you might want to listen to my interview with Harvard negotiation professor Bob Bordone and download my negotiation prep sheet on the downloads page. You might also want to check out episode 14 with Ray Wang, director of the Dorm Room Fund, where we talk about community building. And episode four with Sarah Mitchell of Faraday Futures, where we talk about listening to users, but not all of them at the same time. Thanks for listening and enjoy the conversation. So we're in the conversation, obviously, but I should like officially welcome you to the conversation factory. And let's just start. I'd like you to, to introduce yourself, Claire Wasserman. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Claire. And I'm the founder of Ladies Get Paid, which we basically do what that sounds like. Uh, so we're an organization that provides career development and community to help women advocate for themselves at work. And so for us, advocating for yourself can largely mean salary negotiation and financial empowerment. Although we do a lot of workshops that are outside of the money conversation and, you know, are supporting women to stop feeling like they're an imposter, um, figure out how to have those tough conversations. If their work environment makes them uncomfortable, you know, how do you introduce a diversity program? So basically, <laughs> we think about all the things that make us incredibly anxious we're frustrated with at work, and we try to solve for that by providing education and also a, a support system where we bring the community together online in a private Slack group. That's my very long-winded elevator pitch. <laughs> I need to refine that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's pretty clear. Ladies get paid really sums it all up. Yeah, I'm so I feel so fortunate that I could get the URL. <laughs> for 12 bucks. <laughs> it was available. Couldn't believe it. That's like the first test of a business. It's like, can I get it on Twitter and the URL? Yep. I got the social media handle, did not have to have any underscores or dashes. And so, I mean, you should see my hover account. It's basically like 50 websites I've bought just in case, <laughs> which, you know. Ladies get more paid. Yeah, I even have ladies get laid. Not going to lie about that. <laughs> well, you don't want somebody to like, you know, sneak in in the back and you know thank you poacher. that's exactly what i say you know i don't want to be trolled and i could see that being the first thing that somebody does yeah so. totally so just full disclosure i enjoy the name of this podcast the conversation factory but when i went to make the the logo for the podcast i was like god conversation is a really long word it's yes. really hard to fit on a square icon that reads 50 pixels Duh. so you yeah kept it. yeah but i kept it anyway because it was way too late so yeah, ladies get paid. Nice short words that would totally fit on an icon. <laughs> so kudos to you. You know, when I hear an idea like this, that just, it's so simple and it's so resonant. And one of the quotes I, I have for you that I really loved was about the idea that this conversation needs an overhaul. And obviously I'm highly attuned to the word conversation, but what's broken about the conversation right now about pay equality and how are you overhauling that conversation? Yeah. Like what, what, what are the means and what are the, what are the goals? Yeah. So two things about the conversation before we get into wage inequality, let's just talk about money. We're not talking about it. I mean, at least my family didn't, Yeah. you know, as a society, it's a, still a very taboo subject. I mean, if you live in New York, you're probably asking your friends how much they pay for rent. Would you ever, you know, it's sort of a very New York thing. And people think that's rude in other places. In other places, right. But the thing is, though, are you asking your friends how much they make at their jobs? So safe spaces, comfortable spaces, encouraging speakers to show everybody that if we're going to talk about affecting change, you need to first get comfortable with bringing up the subject of money. Mm. Normalize that part. Then we can begin to take the next steps towards either affecting change in our own personal lives or from a civic engagement standpoint, which I guess speaks to a little bit more of what you were asking in regards to wage inequality. Yeah. So, so with that, 
I think as an individual, we can feel incredibly overwhelmed. We all hear the statistics. It seems like it's a very sort of topic du jour where you know you open up any kind of blog these days and it's like, we get it. So I don't think the problem so much is exposing the inequalities or things that women face in the workplace, <clears throat> Uber. You know, <laughs> we're, we're getting that now. Uh, so that's not the issue. The issue is, what are we doing next? I think personally, as a frustrated, uh, you know, and a lot of the women in the community are frustrated by this, is there's just so much talk. And it's ironic that I'm saying there's so much talk when I just said that we're not talking enough about money. Yeah. You know, I guess what I'm saying is there's too much talk about the shitty stuff that's happening. And, and a lot of articles don't have a part of it where it's here are next steps that you can take um, and achievable next steps. Again, I think so many of us feel like we're, how could we possibly do anything when this is such a systemic issue and it's complicated? And so we've really broken it down into what kind of curriculum can we give people where they are personally empowered? Mm. So, for example, salary negotiation. And then we say, okay, ladies get paid as an organization. We have the ability and, quite frankly, the responsibility to do things on a more macro level. So that is working with companies and, you know, pinpointing the legislation out there where we can have a positive effect. So I don't know if an individual can do much more than negotiating and advocating for themselves. And so that's that's why I encourage people a next step they can always take is finding an organization like ours mm. and, and getting involved because we're the ones doing the work on a higher level that you with a full time job. I mean, quite frankly, you don't have the bandwidth to do yeah. and you shouldn't be beating yourself up about it, which I, there is a guilt factor here. Like, yeah. gosh, I should be doing something. I should like, sure, but you have to be realistic with your time as well. So figure out where you can be most efficient in contributing. And that probably means supporting an organization like Ladies Get Paid. Well, there's two things that I heard that I, it sounds like an individual. Well, I'm going to take two steps back. One, the conversation needs an overhaul. What I heard you say is like, we know that there's a problem, but everyone's like, well, what can I do about it? And it seems like there's two things you're saying people can do. One, have the uncomfortable conversation with their friends uh -huh. and begin to unpack that we're not talking about money. And the other is giving them skills to actually make sure that they are getting paid as much as possible in the moment when they can get that, that extra bit of money out of that moment when you're getting a new job. Yeah. And it's, you know, even though we're called ladies get paid, I mean, we all know money doesn't buy happiness. And quite, you know, we also may work for companies that we love, like a nonprofit or startup, and they, they just don't have the budget. You know, you can negotiate what for what's called full compensation, full comp, which means you're getting paid for, you know, education, you can get flexibility, more vacation days, you know, there's so many other things that are not directly tied to money, but can provide you with a better lifestyle. So I think, you know, this is more of like a, how do I figure out what I should do for a living kind of conversation, but mm. define what success and freedom means to you before you start looking for opportunities and make sure that it's your voice. It's not your parents or society telling you what success looks like, because if you're in a situation and you're just trying to get more money, you may find out that you're still unhappy. So everything that we teach, it's always done with as much context as possible and, and with a caveat too particularly when it comes to gaining entrepreneurial skills, I'm the last person to tell people to quit their job and just start saying that's a pretty privileged suggestion. Yeah. And I don't think that's what you're, what you're saying at all is more like do what, do what you love, get paid as well as possible for what you do. Exactly. And it's also about respect, you know, it's about getting respect and, and knowing your self worth and making sure that that's uh, received by your company you know, where you feel respected, challenged, you know, so, you know, money is just a euphemism for value, really. Yeah, that's what's the best thing we've got. So Claire, can I ask you, it's interesting, you talked about the imposter syndrome, and I think everyone suffers from it. But I do know that there are statistics around men being willing to apply for jobs that seem like maybe one step or two steps out of their reach. And women are not willing to do that. I imagine you're seeing something about that. Is that another piece to bring into this conversation about what, Absolutely. like? Absolutely. Yeah. I have, um, gosh, so we do coffee meetups in the morning, uh, once a month. And there was a woman who came to it and she said, I have a story to tell you. She had come to the last coffee meetup 
I'd never been involved in any of our programming before. I had only recently found out about Ladies Get Paid. And she said when she went to the coffee meetup, she had like that morning found a job online that looked perfect. I mean, it literally was everything that she wanted in her career. It was an incredible company. And as she was reading the the requirements for the job, there were like two or three things on that list that she didn't feel confident about. Yeah. And so she was not going to apply, she said. Um, so she's like, all right, I wrote it off. I was really disappointed that I wouldn't, you know, I wasn't going to be a good fit by the way. I mean, it's like, she's taking herself out of this, let them take her out of it. You know, she's like rejecting herself. Before yeah. She's being rejected by others. Which- let them reject her rather than her rejecting herself. Yes. Which is, and I have a whole like thing about why we're not good with that, but you know, so she comes to this coffee. Well, meetup. Why? I mean, is there a reason, are there steps that people can take to, you know, conclude themselves in the. So I have a little, this is not scientifically proven, but my hypothesis here is that women are not as good at accepting or like, you know, dealing with rejection as men are because men are typically the ones to be asking out women on dates. We've been practicing rejection since an early, early age. You know, it's a numbers game. You know, it's like you ask two people out, then you might, you know, it might be a hundred percent say no, but if you ask 20 people out, Hey, you know, yeah. you're more chances of people saying yes. Obviously. That is that is a fair. I will yeah. cop to that. <laughs> so, so you know, my recommendation is always, you know, don't not that you need to ask somebody out, but like see if there are low stakes ways that you can basically speak up, negotiate, and get rejected. So anyway, so she she comes to this coffee meetup. She meets this woman there. They have a conversation, and this woman says, you know, there's a job opening at my company that I think you'd be perfect for. And of course, it's the company and the job that this woman wanted. Ha. No, and so and so this this woman that she meets says, "All right, when you apply, like send me an email. I'm going to introduce you to the hiring manager." And now this woman is on her third round of interviews with this company. I literally have goosebumps. This is a perfect example of imposter syndrome. It's not just rejection. I, I actually think it's more about not being perfect. It's interesting because I feel like one of the quotes I have. I was listening to your hyperact talk the lunch talk. And, and one of the things you said was, man, I'm not pointing fingers at you. It's just part of a conversation we have to have. Yeah. And so I do want to talk about gendered conversations with something that's important from, I, I want to unpack a little. And, and one of the issues is like a guy like myself who feels like, Hey, I think I'm doing what I can and I'm not a bad guy and I'm not the thing. It's like, and there's a, you certain, don't want to be grouped into that. Yeah. yeah. And, and it, I think guys who want to be allies and advocates feel a little like, uh, oh, I'm a shitty person when we hear all this stuff. How do we manage that difficult conversation of guys who want to help but feel, as I sometimes do, like part of the problem? Yeah, and I, I'm empathetic to that. And also our programming as of now are female identifying only. Yeah. So we have boxed men out of the conversation. Which is why I send my girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. She's like the mole. She can report back. No, and, and we are going to experiment with having a an event where, you know, let's say we let 30 women in and we ask each of the women to bring a guy mm. and you all come, but it's going to be a little bit of an experiment where the only way that you can vocalize yourself is through a question. Mm. So you can't actually get up there and like make statements or quote like mansplain. It's you coming because <laughs> you want to learn. Can you explain mansplaining to me? I There's a... <laughs> Which happens, you know, it really does happen all the time, which you guys may not be aware of, which is why I think a great question to ask, since you only can ask questions when you come, is what is mansplaining? You know, and hearing it from real women giving real examples. So anyway, that's, you know, putting that to... It's like, it's like Jeopardy, right? You're like, the only way you can answer is... (laughs) Oh my God. Oh my God. I didn't think of it that way. That's fucking brilliant. Yeah. Cause it's like, it's like, cause people go on Jeopardy all the time and they forget that you have to form it in the frame of of a question. You're like, and you're like, that was the right answer. But no, you had to... I would be so bad at it too. And like, I'm making you guys do that. I would be shit. No, but there's something, but that's an interesting design for a conversation. Cause you're, what you're trying to do is flip it, flip a normal mode of of communicating or natural mode of communicating, which is interesting. I'd be curious to know how, how you thought of that, like where, where the seed for that way of intervening came from. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the majority of women who are part of ladies get paid really, really appreciate that it's women only. And when I have asked, you know, in like my newsletter, should we include, you know, conversations with men? I get a lot of emails that say, absolutely not. Mm. I agree that there is a time and place for this. You know, there is a lot of value in bringing women together. You know, you have a shared experience despite how different we all are. 
and it's a safe space to speak up without judgment. So I, you know, we're not going to change that. That being said, we work, most of us, except for me, because I work with only women, most of us, you know, live in society and work in places where yes. you're not thinking gender. So for us to not include men in the conversation in some way is really foolish. Mm. That being said, does it mean it's up to these community members to do that? No, this is an organization. This is my responsibility, yeah. which means maybe I don't have an event with men and women. Maybe what I do is I come into a company and I teach a workshop there or I facilitate a conversation there. So again, it's not that we're not doing it. There's just a time and a place and a way to do it. And the reason to have a, a conversation where the only mode of communication for the men would be to ask questions is, I, like I mentioned, I always work backwards from what would be the anxiety, fear, or frustration in an experience. And as a woman walking into that, I would be really worried that a man would like try to tell me how he feels. And, yeah. and there's an assumption, if you're going to be a man and attend this, there's already an assumption that you want to learn yeah. and that you feel boxed out of the conversation. So I don't think you need to tell us that. We, we know by you showing up, you have a willingness to be here. We don't need you to defend your good guy because again, you came, right? You came. Yeah. We know that you're good and you're trying, but what we need to do and what you need to receive is tips, you know, our perspective, sure, but also what can you do in the way that I'm trying to express to the women in our community, don't just feel overwhelmed and shitty about the stuff that's going on. Yeah. There are be action items that you as an individual can take. And then what can we, both from, again, like a company perspective and a government perspective, all do to help, you know, make things better. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I think if you were to ask, you know, let's say you just messaged, well, you messaged me online, right? Ask, what can I do? What can I do to support you? I get a lot of emails from guys. And sometimes, you know, I'll send them a list of links. Here's some reading you can do. Mm. And I said, right now, the best way to help me is connect me to other women, you know, yeah. who you think will support. And that goes a long way. And I've made contacts with incredible women that have been because of the generosity of men opening up their networks to me. Yeah. So you are contributing to change. Totally. Today, and I think, you know, let's not get up on a pedestal and pontificate. Let's why don't just ask us how to help. Totally. It's funny. I'm thinking in my ideation brain, it's interesting. One design of like, oh, men can only ask questions, which is a really interesting way I, I never thought of. I think in summer camp, we might've done a fishbowl where like mm. the women were in a small circle and the men were in a circle around them, but they couldn't speak at all, but they could hear and see everything. And the women in the smaller circle talking about girl stuff created intimacy for the, for the ladies. Eventually they sort of forgot that the guys were there. This is like, we were in junior high school and, you know, getting, letting, hearing girls talk about like, you know, biology stuff and relationship stuff when you're, you know, 14 is like, was eye opening, mm -hmm. but there was still this intimacy and the guys couldn't say anything. We could only listen. Oh my God. That's so good. I forgot about those. We did that as well. Yeah. And you know what I was thinking? The guys should pay f to, to come to the event and the girls should be free. Like oh, that would be. <laughs> Daniel, you're the genius. I'm right? writing this down. It's like, we pay, <laughs> oh we, we, okay. we get, that's how we get to support it. Like, you know, guess what? Ladies, ladies talk free. Men listen, men, men pay to listen, <laughs> which is so maybe just weird, but now you I have think to it's talk. Now, no, I would totally do it. We should pay, we should pay like 70% more or whatever it is to, you know, uh -huh. that would be fair. That would be changing the, I love that. I mean, of course it's yeah. my idea, but. So <laughs> I'm curious about different aspects of community design that you're involved in, because it's really interesting. We talked a little bit before we officially started about how you're designing in-person experiences and the effect that space can have. I want you to talk a little bit about that. And then I want you to talk about Slack and designing that community and then how they are different and maybe how they're the same. Like, I'm just curious if you if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah. I know that I keep talking about anxiety and frustration, um, <laughs> which I get really, I encourage people when they're creating products or marketing, to always think about how the person receiving this feels anxious so that you can address it and, and be positive about it. So it's not about what somebody wants. It's actually about what they need. And for me, I'm most interested in what they emotionally need. So that that's just starting there. Yeah. That's how I design my events. I think about when you walk out of the door, what are all the things that you might be worried about? Does this feel welcoming in the, you know, is the email funny, right? Is this going to be really formal? So it making sure the tone is, is relaxing, especially when our topics are so intense, like the ones yeah. that we do. Um, when you walk in the door, maybe you don't know somebody. So where do you go? 
well, if we bottleneck the line for wine, it's less time for you to be able to feel comfortable because you're not drinking. <laughs> so I make sure, you know, that there is accessibility to getting your drink. So we never do chairs in rows ever. Yes. Super against it. it. You know, first of all, you're looking at somebody's back. So that's already a red flag to me when I walk into another, you know, other events. It feels like school. I didn't like school. So yeah. really that, that I don't want that as part of what I do. It also creates a separation between the speakers and the attendees. And it's essentially saying, you be quiet and listen to these experts. You are beneath them. Yeah. And that is not true. We all have something to learn from each other. And just, you know, and I'm on a million and a half panels. Yes, I have, quote, thought leadership and things to share. But there are people in the audience that could teach me a lot and have something to say. So the way that we do our events, and now we're doing them all over the country, and we have organizing committees that follow a toolkit that we give them on how to do the kinds of events, how to design them in the way that we have in New York. The chairs are in a circle. They're concentric circles. So we have a small circle in the middle, and that's where we put the speakers. And then we have chairs that go in these circles coming out from there. So circles within circles. Yeah. Now I started to experiment where it's kind of like that, but a little bit more of a half circle so that there's nobody ever behind the speakers. Mm. That being said, you know, when we were doing the concentric circles, yes, you may have some speakers with their back to you, but you also had some speakers who weren't. So you could always be like two speakers. So, so that, you know, that makes a huge difference. In the times that we've posted these at venues where the way that it was set up, just the space, you know, really restricted the ability to have these circles. It's not that the event wasn't good and that people didn't share. It's just the energy never built upon itself. You know, and also the women, um, when they're in circles, they're looking at each other. And so when they nod, they're getting validation. Mm. You might catch somebody laughing, nodding. We have a lot of crying. And it just makes you recognize that you're not the only one. And then that yes. in and of itself builds up an energy. And so when you can't see somebody else, it doesn't mean that there aren't people speaking up or laughing or all of that. It just doesn't play off of each other yeah. because they don't see one another. So I've done this enough times. I mean, I've seen almost 3,000 women come through these town halls and it's been really fascinating, but there's a pattern to it. And a lot has to do with the environment. Um, the other thing I'm going to say is lighting. Oh my God, lighting. The lights are too bright. Again, all of this stuff is like pretty obvious, but I think sometimes for those of us who do event production, we, we are moving so fast, we don't remember. When it's intimate lighting, people share deeper stories. And for the kinds of events that I do, it's crucial that people open up very candidly about what they're going through at work. Yeah. So once we did it in a space, actually in a synagogue, this was in DC and the committee there found, you know, a part of the synagogue that we could do this in. And I walked in and the fluorescent lighting just killed me. I thought, oh no, this, no one's going to share. Uh, you know, I don't want to share. The lighting is too bright. Yeah. And I said, let's turn off the lights. And can we go out and buy some candles? And it turns out that the synagogue actually had these little tea lights. They have fake lights. And we put each we put a tea light on each of the 100 chairs. And we, we set it up almost like an altar, with everybody getting their own light. So, you know, there you go. What's interesting about energy, it's, you know, my, my first degree is in physics. So I'm like, I'm literally thinking about, like, you talked about the ceilings being too high before we, mm -hmm. we started. And it's... And people being able to see each other, it's almost like it bounces around. And if the room is too big, it doesn't have a chance to like resonate. And it's not contained. It just doesn't contain the energy just like floats up to the ceiling. So I notice when I'm leading those events, I just have to work so much harder to keep it going. Yes. You're putting, you put more in. Yeah. So for me, what's been really fascinating about hosting these in different cities is, you know, not just seeing what women are talking about because they tend to be quite similar, it's actually how they're communicating it and the energy that they're bringing. So it's like, yes, the space has a, plays a huge part in that, but the cultural norms of what that particular city or that part mm. of the country, you know, what they're wearing, it's radically different in different cities. Yeah. But within this, you know, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, they were all basically wearing the same kind of dress. Mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, I, I just, I was a sociology major and I'm, you know, at the time was like, I'll never use this. It's completely uh, relevant to what I'm doing. That's amazing. So Claire, when you feel, this is a question I've been asking some other people and I, I'm really curious about your sense of this. Like, how do you know when the energy isn't 
where you need it to be? And then what do you do to, to alter it? I can tell what the energy is the minute I walk in the room just by how they're buzzing or not, you know, are women talking to each other? Is it like a, ner- you can tell if it's like kind of a nervous energy or a lack of energy. Um, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, for example, they seemed a bit more timid coming in. And part of that had to do with the space being larger and the lights not being as low as I wanted it to be. Yeah. But also it's a very polite group of people. And they knew they were walking into a conversation that was going to push their boundaries possibly of, of comfort. And so what I did was I had the ability to control the sound from my phone and I got up on the mic and I just said, before we start, I actually have something really, really important to share with you guys and everyone, you know, okay, what is it? And then I pressed the Spotify and I just started playing Rihanna, like Rihanna work. And I, I chose not to do <laughs> bitch that I have my money. Cause I just felt like the cursing, like in yes. this group of people wasn't going to be copacetic. Yes. I just start playing like work. Work and I just like did a little dance and everybody laughed mm. and it was a way to just at least break the energy that had the room had had before and so that I could at least create now my own energy. Yes, humor is huge. Humor is huge. So I I actually introduce every event that I do. I start it in the same way. Sometimes I change things up. Sometimes I have different jokes. But what I do is I well I put out a card in each chair that has the statistic. of women are today's college graduates, but less than 22% make it past middle management. Mm. So I say to everybody, look at that card, let it sink in. And then I I do a whole thing about how I didn't consider myself a feminist even two years ago. Mm. But then I just, you know, I started to read and research and discovered, I list out a bunch of statistics about women not being in leadership positions in any industry and reminding them of how bad it actually is. And that, their presence today, you know, by coming to this thing is an act, is a powerful act. It's the first step towards affecting change by simply showing up. And so I start in a very like kind of depressing way. And I joke that I'm like, sorry to be Debbie Downer. But then I end in this way that's uplifting because I say, you know, raise your glass and look at the woman to your right, to the left, to the front and to the back and do cheers. Cheers to her. Thank her. Thank yourself. It takes courage to come to something like this. And when I do that, I've built them up from a very kind of like, oh God, like it's necessary to be here. We must be here to you've already succeeded by showing up and by giving love to another woman. And everybody cheers. And no matter what city I'm in and what the energy was from when we walked in, they cheers for like five minutes. I have to make them stop. Like, Mm. come on, come on, get back. You're just, it's, you know, or I joke, Thanks guys for coming. The event's over now. (laughs) I almost just made my point in all of this. And, you know, yes, you have to go off of the energy in the room, but I think you need to create your own energy and you have to do it within the first five minutes of the event. Otherwise you're being, you're playing defense. You're always receiving their energy and trying to mold it in the way you want to go versus being uh, proactive and saying, this is, this is the norm of tonight, which is going to be heartfelt. Mm always get a little teary when I talk about the statistics. Heartfelt, it's going to be sort of political and it's going to be uplifting, uh, you know, and uplifting not just within yourself, but to the women around you. And then I'm funny, which I'm probably not because I'm telling you I'm funny. (laughs) I do get a lot of laughter and you just have to make jokes throughout the whole event, A, to keep people comfortable, but B, it's a nice counter to the depressing subjects. Yes. And I think if you look at movies that make yourself cry or movies that make you cry, a lot of times there's kind of innocence or humor that happens. And then very quickly after it's something depressing. And so it's actually the the sort of quick juxtaposition between happy and sad that makes you have emotion even more. Yeah. If the whole thing was just depressing, you'd be numb to it. Yeah. No, it's true. On an emotional roller coaster. And I do that very deliberately. Yeah. There's a rhythm, a cadence, if you will. And it's interesting. You talk about ritual, but the ritual there is for you. Like you do it in a similar way so that you can bring the right energy and bring people into that energy that you're inviting them to participate with you in. Absolutely. And I, and I, I am trying to continually break down what energy means and how to foster it because I think sometimes when people hear that word, they think I'm being like too woo woo about it. Yeah. Feel the energy, guys. I'm like, no, this shit is like, as you know, this is designed. <laughs> it's deliberate. Yeah. Yes, it's spontaneous because I've done it enough times to like feel it and now know what to do. 
None of this is happenstance, though. I, I've been very thoughtful about how to construct a space that leads you down the path that I want this to go. And what is, you know, what is Ladies Get Paid as an in-person experience and as a feeling? Yeah. And this to me is the essence of what conversation design is about. Like you have a specific way you want this conversation to be and to live and you are putting that energy into the system so that it gives it back to you. And you asked me about Slack. It's completely lent itself to Slack. You know, even though the majority of women on their Slack group have never attended an in-person event, it's the same supportive, validating, you know, just to take a step back, I'll talk about what the Slack group is. It's a private group. So in order to gain access, first, you need to be female identifying. And second, you just go to ladiesgetpaid.com slash join. And when you sign up, you're getting on our newsletter and you're getting access to the Slack group. Mm -hmm. We have channels tons of channels and they are broken down, yes, by city and industry, but most people participate in more general channels and those are around salary negotiation. We have an advice mentorship channel, activism, money channel. So you're able to connect with women all over the world around these common, tend to be common pain points and not just interests. Uh, And we have women now in all 50 states and more than 50 countries. So seeing a woman in Romania jump in and, you know, share her story about a negotiation as a way of giving guidance to a woman in Tulsa, Oklahoma, it is fascinating to watch. And that's what they do. They'll they'll come in with a question. They'll say, here's my situation at work. Can anybody help? And they'll get like 10 responses. And again, it's not just women saying, here's what to do, but rather, here's what happened to me. Here's what I experienced. And here's what I did. And that is exactly what the town halls are constructed about. Women sharing stories, but not for the sake of a story, as a way of providing guidance for another woman. And and doing everything's rooted in story sharing, and that's exactly what the Slack has been. I apologize for interrupting, but I'm curious because you know, with the in town, there's you there, you have, you can bring the right energy. With the Slack, how do you feel the sound, the invitation is formed so that people are bringing this this energy that that you want them to to be participating with? First of all, I'm going to take credit for it. I think that's something that women don't do enough. Mm. I think the reason the energy is the way it is in the Slack group and the positivity in particular, it's top down. It's from me and how I started this. First, you know, you come onto our website and the way I communicate our message already sets the tone. And if you're somebody that's not into this, you're probably not going to join the Slack. Mm. So right there, we're already like filtering out, you know, there's a certain personality that would want to join a ladies get paid community. And that's somebody who's like fed up with the status quo, is like fired up to affect change, but can feel insecure at times. So it's a woman who has confidence, but maybe, you know, she needs some strategies and, and has a snarky attitude because we have hashtag fuck the wage gap. <laughs> so personality, you know, already fits with our communication. It was the way that I started this. Um, I hosted a town hall for women to just simply talk about what money means to them. And I had no intention of doing another event or creating a company. But that night when I got home, I I created a Slack group for people to continue the conversation. And so the 200 women that I had, that had either attended or had RSVP'd joined the Slack group and they were the way that this has grown, the kinds of conversations they were having, the the supportiveness. And so by the time that other people joined, the, the norm was there. They saw that there was a certain behavior that one should do within this world. And so you adopt what's appropriate. And there's also a places where people can self-promote. You know, we do have a jobs channel. Yeah. We have a shine theory channel. And that's where I say, go there and tell us what you're up to, what you need, what you're loving. So it's contained on those channels. So things aren't yes. diluted. And that also, you know, there's different energies for different channels. And we've had no trolls, no mean girls, no, you know, it's yeah. been 2,000 women. And one year later, it's been incredibly positive. I've actually had no trolls online. People are just cheering me on. It's really, I I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop because, but so far so good. So it sounds like you're, um, you're using the channels to sort of, so that the main discussion about negotiation and empowerment is not maybe diluted with people asking for jobs or promoting something that we maybe we want them to enable it. We want to enable them to do that, but we don't, we want to separate it out. We're just on a different channel. They're, they're in our group. For sure. And there's a place for it. And we really, I mean, we're all about ladies getting paid. Yes. So we want you to promote what you're doing. Sure. It's just on its own channel within the group. Hey, this is Daniel. We're at about the halfway point. So this is a great time for you to get up, stretch your legs, get some popcorn, fill up your soda, 
If you're in the car, stay focused. If you have your hands free, this is also a great moment to head over to the conversationfactory.com to sign up for the newsletter. I send out more detailed write-ups, insights, and tools from these conversations, and I'd love to share them with you. So head over to the conversationfactory.com and stay in the loop. So Claire, I'm curious about how there's two convers or three conversations we haven't talked about. One, like the community conversation, it's very interesting and it's and but I know you have a team that's helping you do this. And one of the things I remember reading about is how you have the and you mentioned the toolkit. And so you're going and you're sort of seeding this energy, but then there's a team there who is helping keep this going. How do you take care of the team? What's the setup to make sure that that group that is supporting this going forward is supported? That's a great question. And I would say out of everything I've done this year, that has been the greatest learning for me and and learning curve. So the way uh, that it works is women apply to become ambassadors. We tell them that in order to form a committee, an official committee in their city, there needs to be four women, four ambassadors. And we have a number of roles that we have found if there are people who do not fulfill those roles, this committee is not going to work. And they need to be very clear about who's doing what. Otherwise, it's like too many cooks in the kitchen or too many people have one skill set. Yes. So for, you know, setting up sort of the, the uh, gosh, like if you don't have this, you will just fall apart. And we have figured that out by falling apart. <laughs> 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 you know, before, before even starting the ambassador program, I just looked at my process for creating events and I essentially like codified it. I mm. wrote down every single step it takes to do this down to when you buy cups for the wine, make sure you're getting like the small tumbler cups. Otherwise, people drink too much. You know, so, it's, yeah, you know, I, yeah. I went through everything and I didn't expand this program until seven months into this. So I really had enough opportunity to fuck it up <laughs> yeah. on my own. So I made the mistake so that they didn't have to. No solo cups. That's a, just a yeah. bad idea. Yeah, no. That's no like a half cups. a bottle of wine in a solo cup. That's exactly, just... <laughs> exactly. And the quality of conversation goes down, too much crying. Anyway, <laughs> um, seriously. So, so, you know, we, we really set up some of those like structural things with, so we had uh, an internal coordinator, which is the person that makes sure the rest of the committee is doing what they said they were going to do. <laughs> and they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're in the internal wrangler and they are the ones who report back to us so that we don't have like a million people CC'd on things. Yes. Um, there are mode of communication to the channel or to the committee. Then we have the social media person. We have the partnership sponsorship person. And then we have the, um, basically like producer logistic person with the events. So they're the ones coordinating with the venue, making sure the chairs are set up. All of them are responsible for finding speakers and, you know, they can overlap the roles, but just making sure that there's somebody on top of each thing, uh, each of those responsibilities. And so back to like taking care of them, setting them up for success, all of those like small details that contribute to the structure of this program that takes care of them first. Mm, yeah. Second, is looking at, you know, what's the motivation for somebody to do this? Everybody's in it for themselves. Of course, it makes them feel good. Of course, they want to contribute to this cause. Yes. But their time is precious. Their time is money. And so, you know, another reason to do this is they get to be the point person or the face for something that would make very important people in their city take note, especially in the fact that they're looking to get those folks to be speakers. Yeah. So they're now able to, you know, for example, in Atlanta, they got in touch with the woman who, I don't know if she's a psychologist. I think she is. She's the one who coined the phrase imposter syndrome. Whoa. She lives in China, And they're getting her to be a speaker. And the way that they were able to reach out and convince her was because they have this you know, 7,000 person strong community yeah. with good press behind them. And they didn't have to build all that. They can just leverage it. That's amazing. That takes care of them. We also make money. So this this whole thing is a profit share. So that's how we pay instructors. We pay ambassadors. Everybody takes a portion of the profit. So there's still a value exchange happening, which even if it's not much money, I don't believe that people do things completely for free. Yeah. How often are they supposed to run events and how much do people pay for the town halls? Town halls are quarterly okay. in other cities. In New York, we do them more often. Gotcha. But the, the agreement with the ambassadors is they have to produce this once per quarter. Um, ticket sales are, or tickets are $15. They have to do four coffee meetups and four happy hours in a year. Those are free, free tickets. And we ask them to do it in partnership with other women's organizations. Mm. Um, it, it's not, you know, it's just go to a bar, go to a coffee shop. And, you know, there's no like 
design, you know, no event design. It's just a meetup. Yes. And then if they want to produce workshops um, or other kinds of events, everything is a case by case. And our workshops are between $20 and $30, depending on the city or if it's early bird. And then instructors always take 50% of, of those ticket sales. And we operate them out of companies. So we'll use a conference room for a really cool at a company or a co-working space. And the other thing that we're doing that's really, really exciting is we're now teaching women in our community to teach. Mm. So, and those are tend to be the ambassadors. So if an ambassador is really stepped up, um, and wants to get involved more. There are two courses that we are now, we've created toolkits out of those courses. And we now are leading webinars, like almost a yoga teacher certification. It's going off of that model of saying, you know what, there's real power in peer to peer learning. And if we just give you, you know, the resources and, and our expertise, and you've now since, you know, received that from us, why can't you lead a workshop? Mm. And now you get to make more money and we get to scale our in person. It's interesting, the sort of the fractal nature of what you're building makes so much sense where we've all run events where we've done everything and it's, you break your brain against it. And also, how can you fucking scale in-person stuff? You just can't. And, you know, and honestly, the thing that'll be most scaled for us is the Slack group. But I think to not do in-person events, I mean, you really lose the, the special sauce of the community, but we need to scale that. And so in my mind, almost like a franchise style, this is the best way to do it. Yeah, it's genius. So that's a really amazing and interesting structure for how to take care of your team. There's two other conversations I want to track. One is who you go to for counsel and then how you bring that into your own personal evolving self-healing conversation with yourself. I'm really embarrassed to say this, but I have no mentors mm. and no board of advisors. And I, I just had a realization the other day, you know, thinking about my one year anniversary of this will be at the end of August, end of this month. I was like, time to get some help, you know, time to get guidance from those who have come before me. Yes. I mean, I think what's happened is I have now been that person for so many others. I forgot that I also need help and need somebody to like, you know, not show me the path, but at least a diversity of paths, you know, in, in companies that they've created that are around career development or women empowerment. Because I have some decisions I need to make about maybe not so much the direction of this company, but what's the next step to moving forward. I've never taken any investment. It's all been bootstrapped. And I feel like I could keep going that way, no problem. But maybe if I take on investment, I'll go a lot faster. And if I go a lot faster, how will that change things? Yeah. Do I need to go a lot faster? Things have been okay, you know? So. I need somebody to help me weigh the pros and cons and be a sounding board for me. And right now the only person I have is, you know, my therapist uh, <laughs> and, and my girlfriend. So that's about it. Well, that's not nothing though. I mean, at least you're no, no, but that's a thing. Like some people are even afraid to, to go to a therapist. You know, one thing just to, to offer some perspective on this is that in community design, they often talk about how things can only move at the pace of human relationships. Mm, that's and so great. There is that. like, so you can go faster but there's always a price because you're building relationships at a very organic level and a quarterly seasonal approach. And what I love about what you're doing for your team is offering them a clear way to sort of go up the ladder. Like they can start by bringing people into the community and that's one way they can be powerful, but then they can become the people who, who present, they can become the people who are teaching workshops if they really want to. And I think it's, it's really great to give people that, that ladder I guess it's just a question of where you want to, where you want to ladder to <laughs> next and what you don't want to do. Right. I mean, here's the, 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 this is, I think why most people raise money. Um, I, I need to hire people, mm. you know, just, just quite frankly, I, you know, there's a woman in LA who is one of our ambassadors who are now teaching to become a negotiation coach. Mm. I want to hire her full time. She is so good. So good. And to have somebody on the West coast while we're on the East coast, I, I think, you know, just the point person, the face, and she's dedicated to this full time. Yeah. You know, I don't tweet. I do, literally have tweeted like twice in my life. I need somebody who's on that. I mean, we're going to just get so many more people involved if we just tweet. I just can't, you know, I don't have the time. It's not my expertise. Yeah. So it's simple things that I need to compensate people for. And, and I do, I list just, I'm not making enough money to do it. So that to me is the only reason to take on a little bit of investment is to just hire at least one person. Um, so that's, that's where I'm at. 
Otherwise, I, you know, I kind of have everything I need. I don't <laughs> feel like I'm, I don't feel like I'm drowning. You know why? Because I've activated people in my community yeah. to do things. And I have instructors that work off of profit. So I don't require money up front, if that makes sense. Everything, all the compensation comes from people's own work and they're doing it. And we now have a hundred ambassadors and I've managed them. So we're doing okay. Um, and I think more money, more problems, more, you know, people involved, more problems. So it's not about isolating myself. It's just, you know, you, as you said, there's a cost to all of this. Yeah. So, but you know what, not having a mentor, like that's just foolish of me. I, you know, and I think I assumed that it would just happen and, and I now need to put in effort to finding folks who can give me counsel uh, on a, you know, not every day, but where we're, you know, keeping tabs on each other. And there is one person I have in my life who's like, I bow down to her. She, she's incredible. She used to be the CEO of Martha Stewart of guilt group. Hmm. And she has built by girl ventures, which is an investment firm. So she was the one who encouraged me to quit my job and do this. Yeah. And she's met with me. I would say she's been my mentor, but I just don't check in consistently enough because I always want to give her some incredible updates. Mm. I yeah. think that I'm just like the women in my community where like we put way too much pressure on ourselves and feel like we only deserve help if we've been amazing. Yeah, <laughs> but like you go to your therapist whether you're fixed or not, right? Like exactly. that's, <laughs> I mean, it just seems like from from my perspective in conversation design that you need to design your mentorship conversation as clearly as you've tried to design your community and team conversations. That's That would be my pushback is that design is, the whole thing is worthy of being designed. I know, I know. So, you know, ladies get paid all the programming we do. It's because I need it as well. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. This is sublimation in psychology, right? It's we give, we're all wounded in certain ways and we all give to the world what we want. And I think it's a beautiful thing. Claire, we're like coming up at time. Like, is there anything I haven't asked you about this that you think is, is important to discuss? Um, no, but I want to take a moment and appreciate you because I've been interviewed for a ton of podcasts and I have to say, they all asked me the same questions <laughs> and you did not also because of your background with design and, and in-person stuff. And it's like one of the most, one of the things I'm most excited to talk about anyway, but I'm appreciative that you didn't ask me how I started this company because honestly, guys, if you Google me, <laughs> a million half articles, it's all there. This is like the one thing that people know is how I started this. They don't know about the process of designing experiences and how to like expand a business when you have no money. So <laughs> thank you. And I, you know, thank you for letting me talk about some other stuff. Yeah. And, now it's yeah. fascinating. I, you not clearly... to shame other people who've interviewed me. Very appreciative to them too. But yeah. um, you got you let me talk about the things that I'm particularly excited about. Well, this is the nuts and bolts of how the thing really works. It's clearly a, a really resonant idea that is growing. You know, when we talk about energy, like it's growing in momentum. And I think it's really, really awesome. I'm also tapping into, you know, back to like, how do you create energy in a space? The energy is already happening in our cl- political climate. You know what I mean? It's like mm. they're bringing to them a, like a frustration and a, a desire to do something because they're just seeing all of these rights, not just for women, but so many groups just erode every day. Yes. You know, so I, I did start this well before the election, not well before it was like at least five months before. Yeah. But after the election really became the organization, a lot of women have gone to just to be like, how do I like, it's not a, necessarily about political activism, but how do I incorporate ideals from that into my everyday and through work? So I always want to acknowledge that, you know, part of what we're doing, it is very much in tandem with the times, but anybody who has a business, you know, that a, a huge piece of what you do, it, it has to be the right timing for it, for it to catch. Yeah, totally. It really does. <laughs> and you can't, you can ride that wave. You, it's hard to make that wave. Yes, exactly. Well, Claire, I'm going to officially thank you for your time. And I really appreciate your honesty and your openness. It's been a real pleasure to talk with you. It's nice to catch up and connect. Thank you. And I really appreciate that you have been following along and that you're a man and you've reached out. That, that ah. gives me faith in the world. And we're going to leave it right there. Thanks for sticking around. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or Google Play. Thanks for your fine attention, and I'll see you next time.